Morning everyone. This video lesson is about analysing the poem London by William Blake. So in this session we're going to explore the presentation of power and conflict in the poem London. We're going to explore a range of poetic techniques within the poem and link those to power and conflict. And most importantly, we're going to confidently annotate the poem. For this session, you're going to need a copy of London. I've put a link to a copy of it in the description of the video and a pen and paper or just access to a Word document to complete the activities. So to start us off, can you remember the key quotations from the poem that we talked about in the last video? There were three of them. I've put them here for you with a few blanks. So near where the blank Thames does blank and so on. Pause the video and see if you can copy out and complete those three quotations from the poem London. So you should have got near where the chartered Thames does flow. And we talked about the word chartered meaning owned or used as a commodity owned by a business or by royal charter or by the state. So this, the Thames, a natural river, just there if read in existence way before London was built, has been chartered, has been owned by someone, which is bananas. You shouldn't be able to own a river necessarily. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear. So everyone's crying out in fear or worry in the city of London, even men, even infants. So young children are crying out of fear as well. So the people aren't happy. And every blackening church of Paul's, um, that word blackening, which we'll look at shortly, could be a physical thing by like the smoke and the smog of London, just going and blackening the white surface of the church. Or it could be more symbolic, the idea of the holiness and purity of the church being rendered dark and sinful and evil. Right, so the poem is there for you to have a look at on the left. In terms of power and conflict, uh, in the last video we talked about these two terms here and we decided that in terms of power, Blake is saying that London is in essence too powerful, the, the place itself is powerful and dominant, the people are powerless and they're being kind of crushed by this all powerful city and this all powerful wealth that London has, uh, and again the power of money, this wealth is causing these uh, wealthy people to take advantage of these poor people um, and ruin their lives. In terms of conflict, there's definitely a conflict between London or the rulers in London and its population. There's a conflict between rich and poor. And there's definitely a conflict between industry and nature. Think about chartered Thames flowing right, and blackening, suggesting this kind of smoke going there like we talked about just now. So what I'd like to do is I'm not going to read it out to you this time. Just have a read through the poem. Can you see any words or phrases that could relate to the above statements about power and conflict? So I'd write down the statements about power and conflict and just see if you can find any phrases that you could link to it. As a challenge, you can decide on your own interpretation of power or conflict from the poem and you can select a quotation to justify that one. So pause the video, have a go at that. OK, now we're going to start annotating the text itself. So I'm going to talk you through various annotations that are going to come up on the screen. If at any point you need to pause it, obviously do so. If I'm going to quickly, we need to get all of it down. That's fine. So have your copy of the poem to hand and make sure you're annotating what I'm about to tell you here. So in terms of form, this poem is written in first person. So it says, I wander through each chartered street. So it's like the poet, just like Blake himself is wandering through it. And typically first person is used in poetry to make it seem more immediate, more real, rather than there is a chartered street in London. I am here, I'm seeing this chartered street. I'm seeing all of this horrific stuff happening in front of me. It's real, it's immediate, it's right now. And again, that adjective chartered, which we talked about already, the idea of being owned or sort of official. Again, it's like London is taking control of nature. And also that word chartered is repeated. So the streets are owned, the river is owned, is chartered. And again, as humans, we like 
to believe that we have freedom. And again, you should be able to walk anywhere you like in London. But again, there's places you can't because it's private land. Someone owns it. And it's talking about how this money, this wealth is restricting access to the land, which surely doesn't belong to anyone. We should be able to walk where we like. And it's kind of that illusion of freedom that we have being crushed by London here. And again, that conflict between nature and industry or nature and money. A lot of emotive language in this poem. There's a lot you can talk about here, but I've talked about the, I picked out the word woe. Uh, again, woe is an extreme sadness, a lot of suffering. You know, I'm feeling a lot of woe here. Um, so people are feeling a lot of sadness and suffering as a result of this life in London, one presumes. And I also quite like, I think more significant than woe is the repetition of the idea of marks. Um, a mark can refer to, say, like a, a facial expression, like I see a mark of something in you. But I also quite like the idea that it's physically there. So not just something that's not tangible, but something that's physically marking the face. So this suffering is physically marking the people's faces. Um, and if you've been on the underground in rush hour, let's say seven, eight o'clock at night or something, and you see people with their sort of grey, haggard faces thinking, oh, this is horrendous, having not you know, been outside necessarily. I think we can see that in a lot of big cities where there's this real business, there's this real emphasis on industry and money making. Um, you can see the suffering on people's faces. I think that's still true today in many ways. In terms of structure, I quite like the fact that this poem is quite contradictory. It's got a regular structure, which means it's four line. It's the same pattern, essentially. So it's got a regular rhyme scheme. Street, flow, meet, woe, man, fear, ban, here. So the, it rhymes. It has four lines in each stanza. It's got quite a bouncy sort of rhythm. I wander through each charge of street, that kind of iambic rhythm as well. Um, and it sounds quite happy. Almost, it's got the same kind of tone as like a nursery rhyme when you actually read it. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames to flow, a mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. It's got a really happy, bouncy kind of tone to it, but the actual content is really serious and really dark. So I think that happy sound really juxtaposes this serious tone um, to create this really dark, sinister feeling here. But also, you could argue that I think when poets do use that kind of happy nursery rhyme tone. Nursery rhymes are, are the simplest form of stories that we tell children, you know, two, three year olds here. We tell them nursery rhymes because it's really simple for them to understand. So it might be that in this poem, the message that Blake is trying to send that London is horrible, it's really unfair, and this wealth is ruining everyone, is a really simple, simple, simple message that even a, an infant could get. All right, And he's kind of hammering that home with the tone and the actual the, the rhyme scheme and that kind of happy jaunty sound up to you which way you go with that um again there's lots of repetition of cry showing the suffering everyone so it's affecting everyone every cry every man every infant every voice so all around london and i quite like the fact that actually if you look at the nouns there man infant voice every man every infant, every voice. So it goes from men to children to voices. So even the people you can't see, the voices are suffering. And the metaphor at the bottom is quite interesting. The mind forged manacles I hear. Manacles are handcuffs. I think actually they're more specifically, they're the leg braces, like the big leg handcuffs that you might see in, you know, old Elizabethan kind of like uh, dungeons and things. All right. Um, but either way, they're restraints. So it suggests that people are kind of imprisoned by London. right? They're kind of trapped. That's what manacles do. They trap and imprison people. But they're mind forged. They're forged or made in the mind. So people are imprisoned by what they have in their mind. Like they think we have to be here. This is the capital city. This is, you know, the streets are paved with gold. There's lots of opportunity here. We have to be in London. But, you know, they don't. But their minds are kind of trapping them here. And that's that's quite hard hitting. As we move on, then, there's lots of emotive verbs. So cry, appalls and sigh. Lots of emotion and torment here. The chimney sweepers are crying. The churches are appalling. The soldiers are sighing. And with the soldiers, I like the image of the soldiers here because there's lots of juxtaposition on both sides. Hapless is just an old fashioned word for helpless. Looks quite similar. And obviously we know a sigh is kind of a oh, that exhale of uh, exhaustion and sadness here. So soldiers, again, are supposed to be tough strong people here defending the country but they're in this situation they're helpless 
and they're sighing. There is an interpretation that this is possibly due to the idea of the revolution. And then again, the revolution happened in France just beforehand and the soldiers were powerless. You know, the people were far stronger and the soldiers are kind of just letting the chaos happen, essentially. Um, so again, they're supposed to be tough, but here they're helpless and sighing with weakness. There's the image of the blood running down the palace walls, which again could get linked to revolution and chaos like the French Revolution. But also, I think it's significant that the palace, if we think of the palace as where the king and queen is Buckingham Palace, there's blood, chaos on their walls. So right where you think it should be safest, there's blood and there's danger. Uh, the last stanza is the most harrowing, in my opinion. So you've got the midnight streets, so they're dark, dangerous streets. A um, bit of enjambment as we go on. So there's no punctuation after walls here, curse or uh, tear or even hearse, actually, which again, the lines sort of go on without stopping, much like the suffering just keeps going and doesn't stop. And this last stanza, I'll give, take a couple of minutes over this here. I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts a newborn infant's tear. So a harlot is a prostitute. The curse is swearing. So the newborn infants have tears because they're babies, they're crying, fine. But these prostitutes who have babies are cursing them to blast their tears. So the babies are crying and their prostitute mothers are swearing at them, shouting and swearing at them to tell them to stop crying. You know, stop effing crying, you little whatever, um, which is a really, really horrible image. Uh, which and he saves this till last actually um curiously enough he saves that for right at the end of the poem here um and right at the end you've got that last line and blights with plagues the marriage hearse um a hearse is the big car that carries the coffin in uh, to a funeral that's what a hearse is um, but also a plague is a disease so these prostitutes are causing disease to the marriage hearse um which again implies possibly there's lots of infidelity in london at the time um, causing STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, and causing marriage to be dead, deadly, effectively. So marriage is doomed in London. This sacred, you know, beautiful, happy thing is ruined. And again, that juxtaposition that Blake keeps using shows how dark and how horrible London has become. Again, if you need to pause the video or go back to the first uh, section of this, feel free, take your time to get these down. Okay, so now we've looked through those annotations as i said in the ozymandias video and we'll do the same with this one it's really important uh to reduce the amount of stuff you undoubtedly now have on your piece of paper on your annotations here and just pick out a few things uh to memorize so much like before um, just pick out three quotations or features. So again, it doesn't have to be a quotation. It could be um, some enjambment. It could be the first person form up to you. There's lots of examples to choose, but pick three to memorize. And to do this, you could just circle them in a different color in your anthology. You could put them on a revision card again, maybe with a clue on the other side. So you could have maybe a soldier uh, looking helpless on one side, on the other side, the actual quotation up to you or put them in a small revision book. Um, which will hopefully be the starting point of your revision here. And if you have for each of the 15 poems, if you have just a few cards or like maybe a one page in a book and that's your page for that poem, you'll find that so much more manageable than trying to read through the masses and masses of annotations, uh, which are undoubtedly on your poem at the moment. So pause the video and pick out what you think are the three most significant features to you. They're all significant, but which are the three most significant ones to you that you would like to remember and be able to recap and recall another time. So pause the video and have a go at that. Hope that was useful.